just to let you know what's happening. Um, the, uh, the next, uh, we will, we've got five speakers from industry and university, um, who are going to be introduced in a minute. And uh, what we've asked them to do is a pitch creature format. Now, who's, who's come across that before? All right, so this is a great way when you don't know if the speaker's going to go on and on and on to keep it reined in. Um, they have been given 20 slides, and their slides will advance after 20 seconds each no. slide. Yeah. Um, I don't think hardly any of them have ever done this before, so I hope you'll be forgiving if they, some of them are a bit nervous here. Um, Understandably, um, but this uh, this part of the evening has been organised by the New Zealand Computer Society, who have actually helped um, quite a bit behind the scenes with organising this, this whole event too, with uh, some of the practicalities. Uh, and so I'm going to actually hand over to the local rep, which is Steve Davis here, and uh, he's going to try and manage this for the next few months. So good luck. Thanks, Steve. Hi, as, as Tim says, I'm from the New Zealand Computer Society, um, and we're all about professionals in the IT industry, either <coughs> practicing or those aspiring to be professionals, so coming up through um, academia um, and students. Um, some of you may be aware we were involved in the um, report uh, a few years ago that uh, brought about a lot of the changes that have got you involved in uh, computing um, teaching, um, introducing the new achievement standards to actually bring some science back into computing instead of just using computers. So uh, I'm not sure whether we're to blame or whether you're uh, <laughs> happy about it, but uh, we're very passionate about um, introducing students at all levels to um, ICT and getting them passionate about the industry and helping us to build the future professionals to fill the, the skills gap that uh, many um, players in the industry talk about. And maybe uh, our speakers tonight will touch on some of that. Um, as well as those standards, um, some of you will be aware, uh, it's almost a couple of years ago now, we ran a pilot program for what we called ICT Connect. And that's all about putting professionals from industry into the classroom to teach, uh, to tell your students a bit about industry, about jobs, um, and to hopefully engage with them to make them more enthusiastic about the ICT industry, um, hopefully break down some of the geeky stereotypes that are out there and uh, get them interested in um, what is a very broad and diverse industry uh, um, for a career choice. So, uh, um, that uh, is launching uh, full-time next year. We've just engaged uh, a full-time staff member to uh, take that on amongst uh, other youth engagement projects. So uh, stay tuned for um, uh, some contact from the society to the schools to try and see how we can fit that into your curriculum uh, and timetables, either as a, a careers option or as part of your uh, computing uh, curriculum. And leading on from, from that, once once they get out of school, and hopefully they've chosen ICT, they get into academia. Um, we've got uh, a program there, uh, students of NZCS, so we're again trying to engage with uh, the youth, um, help them run their own programs while they're at university, um, to, and to help them engage with industry. So making those connections for their career choices, um, and hopefully uh, getting jobs at the end of it as well. So uh, we, we're very much about connecting um, students, academia and industry and uh, we run a number of events to that effect and we uh, keep very much in contact with uh, uh, our members and others in industry to, to achieve that uh, and hence uh, our involvement here tonight. Anyway, as, uh, as Tim said, tonight's uh, sessions are, are fairly short and sharp and uh, with that in mind we'll, uh, we'll start off. Our first uh, industry speaker is John Escroft from uh, uh, Jade um, is uh, Chief Innovation Officer and uh, poster boy of the uh, Air New Zealand magazine, if anybody's seen it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, John uh, has uh, been heavily involved in a number of aspects of uh, education in the industry and uh, um, also Jade has been a fairly major employer of uh, ICT innovative people over the years. Uh, We'll hand over to John. Thanks, Robert. Steve, sorry, just pull that curtain there. We can't see your face against the large things. Right, let me just get this started. I, uh... Thank you. Oh, that's ridiculous. Where does this go? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Steve. 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 Thanks, Ste
Yeah. As Tim said, uh, these uh, speakers have, may not have come across this format before, and some of them may or may not have mastered the technology for the 20 second uh, automatic update. So, right, we'll before I start, I'm going to cheat here by taking a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen this one. <laughs> where the presenters don't actually know what slides are going to come up. And <laughs> since I can't see the monitor, that's pretty much what you're going to get today. So I do actually have a rough idea of what's coming up. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, I work for Jade Software. We're uh, headquartered locally in Christchurch, but we've got offices throughout the world. Um, just one thing I would like to say is that I got into computers because I had a particularly great teacher in year, what is I think year 12, the old sixth form when I was a high school student last century, and uh, that's what inspired me to be part of it. What I've done is Steve mentioned our ads that are running in the New Zealand magazine. I've taken a copy of some of those. So Andrea, for example, works for us. She's a brand manager. Um, she has a degree in marketing and psychology, and she works as part of a, a marketing group. So I've picked out um, ads to just sort of show the representative people. Bo um, works for us in our police and investigations uh, product. He's a software developer, so he's got a um, BSc, I think, um, and he's helped us a lot. Funny enough, Edmund, um, we've got some users in China, and he's been over a couple of times to work with them. Um, bright boy. Bruce is a genuine computer scientist, and uh, actually was a professor of computer science here at Canterbury uh, before he lured him away into industry, and he's working on some quite complex stuff in the analytics space. Um, great guy, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> 20 seconds can be an awful long time. Igor. Igor came to us on a student exchange program from South America um, and has worked in both Christchurch and then we transferred him to Melbourne. One of the nice things about having uh, multinational companies is that we can offer graduates um, the chance to work overseas. So we send people to the UK. Um, I had a year in the States, for example. Um, it just makes a difference when you can offer more than just Christchurch. Mia is a graphics designer that works for us. So she did a um, design degree at CPIT, came to us, worked on a project, and we liked it so much we kept her on um, after she finished her degree. Um, so she works on things like some of the design work and the ads, that sort of thing, um, and screens, that sort of, obviously. Steve Anderson is the head of our investigations product. So he runs a team of five or six people. His background is more in project management, um, but he's working with a bunch of developers and has a lot of that software as well. Um, that's done at the end of the stockyards. Carl is a computer science graduate. So he's, again, working in the analytics space. Very bright boy. He's running a team of three or four developers um, at quite a young age. Um, and the stuff they're doing is, again, in the computer <coughs> science pattern matching, um, quite complex algorithms that are actually beyond me. But they tell me it's hard. Robbie is one of our most recent uh, hires. Robbie's still a student. We actually hire him. He's our social media specialist. So he was literally paid to update Facebook and Twitter. And he's working about 20 hours a week for us um, and studying the rest of the time. And he's the first if you ever follow like um, our Facebook pages or our Twitter sites, that was Robbie that was updating them. These four, um, we ran one ad together, they're from The Shared, so that's Tyler, Hadley, Dale and Greg. A um, bunch of young guys, one of them came straight to us from school. Um, two of them have got computer science degrees, one of them's got a commerce degree, all in computing. Um, great bunch of young guys all work together, and in fact, in the workplace, we call The Shared. So, this is the sort of most funky we get in terms of environments. Um, but they've got typically rock music playing on the TV. We had it all done up as a shed. Um, you can't see all the detail there, but the corrugated iron is sort of part of it. Um, the corrugated iron and the ceiling fell down in the first earthquake, so we didn't put it back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a, a more normal sort of workplace where the guys are sitting generally in open plan because we're working in team environments. Um, that's one of the things where you get a slight like conflict between what you tend to do in study and what happens in the real world because. In study, everything is individually assessed. In the workplace, everything is based off of teams. Um, they, I asked them to put in a shot of a cafe. Not only have they taken it late at night, well, in the evening, so they've got wine bottles and glasses. Um, they've also made it look like the size of a matchbox. 
but it's actually a, a nice big open cafe and I was just planning, hoping to show sort of what it's like to work there, although obviously that's not <laughs> what I intended. Um, and finally we run um, around 300 computer systems all around the world, 24 by 7. So the guys um, in this role here, operators, um, some of us have a degree from Polytech, some of us have just got a keen interest in computers. Um, we have, we run shifts obviously to cover the 24 by 7 aspect, and they're there, day and night. Um, when we talk about the brand, I just wanted to say that we, we actually think about what we want the company to mean. Um, this was developed by our staff, and we use this to hire people as well as you know, producing stuff like marketing material. So we're actually looking for people that project a sort of personality. And in terms of the values we try to develop within the company, a couple of them I'd mentioned. One is the being real stuff. So all the people you see in advertising, all the people you see on our website are really our staff. You can come and meet them. And in terms of the values, spontaneous, fun, high performance culture, beautiful design are all really important in what we do. Obviously you can't schedule spontaneous fun, but you can sort of create an, an atmosphere where it can happen. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about our customers, so sort of people that you could end up working with if you can't work with us. Um, ports, we have ports um, up and down New Zealand, Australia, we're just sort of one in Iraq at the moment, we've got one guy there, try and organise insurance for that. Um, the police, I mentioned the investigations probably once or twice, we've got police forces around the world, in China I mentioned, also in the UK, Australia, throughout the Pacific Islands, using our investigations and intelligence product, and watch that space, there's going to be a lot more of that next year. And then I've got coming up, um, just a hodgepodge of brands, some of which you should recognise, big New Zealand brands like The Warehouse, um, World Vision, New Zealand, Australia, UK, all um, uh, running on software we've written, and software that we run day to day in that operation centre we saw before, um, Fonterra is a major customer of ours, so you get to work with some pretty good brands. So finally, I'll just leave you with this, that's Ben, he's uh, um, uh, one of our most senior sales guys, he's just moved to Melbourne, um, he's, had a, he's sold so much in New Zealand we thought we'd try him out on the Aussies, <laughs> and uh, so his smiling face is just a reminder of what a great place Jack is. Uh, been pretty successful in, in showing some of the diversity of uh, what we look for in the industry. It's not purely technical, there's uh, a wide range of supporting areas that uh, uh, need to go into the industry as well. And uh, also some of the things that we uh, um, talk about is the, the soft skills, not necessarily the purely technical things, but being able to communicate and uh, being a part of the team and that sort of thing. So uh, John did fairly well there. Next up, we have <coughs> Wagner from Fine Mind. <laughs> can, we, can we ask some questions while we're waiting? Okay. Can you tell us about the enforcement software? What, the, um, oh, that's quite, I'm sure that our kids would be really interested in something like that. That's a very interesting part around schools. We developed it for the Australian Federal Police, and they've gifted it to a number of island countries, which is why it's in mm -hmm. all the Pacific Islands. Um, it really records a bunch of facts. It might record the fact that, you know, I live at this house, somebody else drives a car, we saw this car at this crime scene, um, and then it draws up big network diagrams, and so you can actually end up seeing, it's almost like um, something off TV. It draws a lot of connections, and you can say, is there a relationship between this person and this person? And it will come and say, yeah, actually, we know that this phone called this phone, this phone blocked this guy, this guy was seen with this person. And it links through this photos of guns and bombs. It's quite a um, glamorous, you know, side of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not my fault. Sorry, keep going. Okay, Ed uh, Wagner from Tate Electronics. Um, I'm sure nobody uh, would not know who Tate Electronics are. One of the big successful stories of the tech industry here in uh, Christchurch. And uh, while they build radios, more and more it's becoming uh, computer based and software engineered. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Ed will tell us a little bit about that side of it. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so, excuse me, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> I, I really enjoy talking to groups like this, but I've never done this before. Uh, and I've got a tough act to follow here, too. It's a good job, John. Um, so I'm going to have a cheat sheet with me. Okay, 
I've got three ideas I'd like you to remember from this. One, there's really interesting work right here in Christchurch for software engineers. Two, we don't have enough people who are trained to do this work to meet just even the local demand. Uh, we also need more women in the field. It's really important. Now, that's, that's actually two ideas when I'm counting that as one. <laughs> the third one is the pay's not bad. Not bad. <laughs> uh, this is a photo of Tate staff in Christchurch. We've got 500, 550 people here, another 200 or so overseas. It's blurry. I'm back there. There are over 100 software engineers at Tate. Over 100. Uh, our, uh, our markets are public safety. You heard about the police. The police, fire, ambulance. Also, electrical utilities and urban transport, buses, subways. Uh, light rail systems, people who need critical communication infrastructure. Uh, these are some of our core products, uh, the radio terminals, mobile and portable, as well as more high-powered base stations that repeat at higher power, and communications networks that provide long-distance communication. I'm going to talk to you about a base station here. Oh, we also develop applications that uh, configure, monitor, and diagnose these systems, as well as end-user applications like location services and workforce management. Well, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, uh, if two people have radios and they want to talk to each other, they just get on the same channel and talk, and the signals goes back and forth. Back and forth. And this works really well as long as they're relatively close to each other and there's not something in between them obstructing the, the path. So it all makes good sense. But what happens if they're on opposite sides of a hill, for example? So there we put an antenna up on the top of the hill and transmits up to that antenna. It's repeated at higher power over a longer distance so that people can hear it on the other side or farther away. But there's some important equipment up there in that radio shack up the top of the hill, and this is what one of the pieces of equipment looks like. It's a base station or a repeater. Uh, we connect computers to it and program it, run configuration software, diagnostic software, etc. But there are five microprocessors inside that base station now, and the total software source code for this whole system is approaching a million lines of code. Uh, here are three of our software engineers. There's Bill, he's from the UK. <coughs> George is from China, Matthew's a Kiwi. They write the software in C and C++ that drives the hardware. Not in script. Here's Tom and Kelly. Tom's from the UK. He's been here a couple years. Kelly got a computer science degree from Canterbury about 16 years ago. He's been with us since. Uh, Kelly works on the uh, the user interface that's a web browser base that helps configure those base stations. So it's all stuff like this. He, his software is mostly written in Java, but then gets translated to JavaScript and HTML and displayed on a browser. So you can configure equipment like ours from a browser. Now I've got some other folks coming up. Yeah, so this is Paul. He's also on the left, a junior software engineer. Uh, from New Zealand, and then there's Thomas, he's from Germany, and, and Nathan, he's from the UK. Uh, they work on the signaling software, the stuff that does all the heavy-duty algorithms um, that ensures that the, these are digital radios, not analog radios. So <coughs> things like addressing compression, searching and sorting, error correcting coding, encryption topics like this, classic computer science topics. Um, so all our software staff typically have a minimum of three or four year undergraduate degree in computer science or computer engineering. Uh, many have masters or PhDs, but have you noticed how many are from overseas? Mm -hmm. And have you noticed the predominance of males? Yes. Yeah, that's not right. Well, it's true, and we in industry in general have quite an unhealthy gender balance. Uh, we do have some females, so there's Magda. She's from Czech Republic, and Lucy is from the UK, and Charlotte's from the UK. You're getting the picture. Yeah. Um, 
So we mostly grow our Kiwi workforce by taking on between 10 and 15 interns from university over the summer each year. These are four of them of the 15 we've got this year. Um, we typically then hire between a half and a third of those when they eventually graduate. So we, we're doing some active recruitment uh, in universities, but it's still not enough because these are other people just here in Christchurch who are after the same graduates. And we're not unhappy with that, it's just that we all need more. Uh, so these are other companies who do similar things to us, and there are another 30 of those, and another 40 software companies that are pure software. Uh, so the topics these young people, your young people, need to study in high school have been the ones on the outside. Mathematics and physics and chemistry and graphic design, a bit of electronics. But I'm personally so happy that there's now a computer science curriculum as well in the high school that's appropriate for us. Uh, so how much do these folks make? Uh, we generally start grads from university in the mid to low 40s, but within a couple of years, they're earning 50 to 60K. Most of them have been with us for a few more years after that, are 75K or more, and some are up to 110K and over. So these are our principal engineers who are really hard to find. So my three points. One, there's cool work to do here, right in Christchurch and around New Zealand. Two, we need a lot more qualified software engineers, uh, especially women. And, well, I think the pay's okay, but I'll let you be the judge. Thank you. Somebody made the comment about uh, Scratch and uh, Ed's theme, the right fit, I think, is uh, what uh, applies there. Uh, there are good languages for teaching and there are good languages for different applications in the industry. The, the previous question was really in case you don't understand it. There is an international talk like the Pirate Day, and we celebrate it every year at Tay. That's what she was asking. Yeah. Internship, so that only for university students. Yes. What actually are they as an internship? When do they enroll as an intern? Uh, we generally like them in their penultimate year, so they've got one more year at university. That's third or fourth year, at least. Generally speaking, yeah. So we've got one first-year student this year. Who's doing an internship? Uh, what does an internship involve? Uh, they do real project work, so it's not make work. It's doing stuff we need done. Um, they typically start right after the classes end in November at uni, and run right until they start. So sometime in late February. Right. So it's uh, like a holiday. The summer summertime. Yeah, it's summertime work. It's. 40 hours a week, working with a mentor, one of one of our typically senior engineers. Now you said you take about a third to half the, the interns on permanently. Yep. Why is it you're not taking all of them? What happens with the others? Do they get jobs elsewhere? Yeah, they get jobs elsewhere. That right. was the slide it's not that they're inadequate or... Oh. Well, I mean, you, you're going to be yeah. able to choose. I mean, not reason. perfect. No. And not everyone chooses us. That's yeah. why we do the internships. So they go, oh, that was interesting, but no, that's not the work I want yeah. to do. Many organizations like Tate's would like to take on more, but budgets. Yeah. yeah. That's the reality of Many life. of them do their own event, too. Yeah. yeah. And there's some other areas, again, we're mainly looking at um, graduates rather than straight from school, but um, the Computer Society is working on uh, summer internship programs. Um, there is some work being done in what's been considered a, a sandwich year instead of a gap year um, that uh, likes a Trimble, one of the organisations that Ed mentioned earlier, is very keen on. Um, so we'll be working towards uh, looking at how we can help um, as an industry body with that sort of environment, um, as I say, mainly for graduates but, uh, or those getting close to graduation. Um, and also mentoring, so once they get into the industry, partnering them up with members of our society to give them that ongoing mentorship. So, Anyway, carrying on. Our next speaker, uh, Richard Lobb, um, is from the Computer Science Department, um, or Computer Science and Software Engineering as it is nowadays. 
Um, I, uh, I was told that uh, we were going to have a mix of uh, some industry people and some academics, so uh, um, Richard flips into the academic side, so uh, I'll hand over. Right, well I think I should start with the standard Alcoholics Anonymous type of introduction. <laughs> I'm Richard Lobb and I'm passionate about programming. <laughs> <laughs> the students who I tell are Richard. Hello. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> it's a pretty sad thing to be passionate about. But okay, I've got other passions as well. Now, I'm not supposedly going to show words, but actually I cheat. There are lots of words here. This is just introducing you to the idea of a tag cloud, which is meant to somehow or other capture the essence of a subject. In this case, I've thrown in the uh, Wikipedia page for Petra Kutcher, and it's uh, not terribly interesting, but you get the idea that the size of the words is meant to be their relative importance. So now here's a more interesting one. This is the web page from Wikipedia, which is meant to somehow or other capture what uh, computer programming is about. But to me, it totally fails to capture what I think of as computer programming, because the word fun doesn't occur there anyway, <laughs> or anything even vaguely emotional or exciting or passionate. So here's this. <laughs> in those days, 1970s, if you were a game player, you were a programmer because you had to type the game in first of all, and then hack at it to play with it. And in fact, there was a very famous essay written in the mid-1970s by a guy called Fred Brook, excuse me, Fred Brooks. And he wrote an essay, Why Programming is Fun. And here's his article on uh, why programming is fun. And this, to me, gets much closer. Words like delight, fascination, fun, programming things that work, constructing stuff. He even got uh, words like God and poetry in there as well as part of the real essence of programming. And then, unfortunately, in a about 1975 or so, a big black cloud descended upon the world and sucked all the joy out of programming, and it was called software engineering. Kirker, 1975, I might add. And it was full of words like discipline and work and um, functional requirement specifications. And <laughs> programmers were delegated to the lowest possible level. They were the people who tightened the bolts and nuts in the production line. And the real people didn't do that. So 25 years we had this obsession with the wrong sort of thing. <coughs> but then light shone again, and here we have, come join us. Programming is fun again. It's a whole new world out there. And this notion that programming could be fun again has somehow or other <laughs> Infected the world, and now you see even software engineering has reclaimed it. Because what happened there was the programmers reclaimed software engineering, and this has brought a new life back into the discipline. Agile development, programming is fun, cool programming languages for kids, Python, Alice, whatever else. So we're back into the fun time, but what's missing from this? Programming is still fun, but those guys probably would get a little bored after a while, and that what's missing, of course, is competition. So a new idea comes in now, and that is programming in a competitive mode. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is programming competition. And here we have the New Zealand uh, Olympiad, uh, Informatics Olympiad team in Bulgaria, 2009. There's the four of them competing, 80 nations competing, something like quarter of a million school students having been distilled down to the teams there, and each of them is programming a set of problems, seeing how quickly they can get them solved in a given time. There's the team, two of them got bronze medals. One of them is now representing New Zealand, or will be this year, in the ICPC, the International Collegiate Programming Contest, which is the tertiary level. And he's in our team from Canterbury, off to uh, where are we going this year? Um, I forget. <laughs> and if you want to, as school teachers, you probably should be aware of this, try and get your kids out into them. You should possibly know about the New Zealand Olympiad in Informatics, which is the sort of training ground for the International Olympiad. And uh, you can go to that website, uh, nzoi.org.nz. And here is one of the training camps. The NZOI runs a training camp every year. It's something like a week long, depends on what level you're at. And there the kids learn programming algorithms and techniques, so you also learn about uh, sort of group activities and uh, sort of team building things, and they have a great time, so that's fun too. Another way you could, thing you could mention to your kids is if they're mathematically inclined, possibly a little bit more 
uh, esoteric. This one is projectoiler.net, and that's for kids who like mathematics and programming, and they can merge the two together and solve mathematical programming problems with computers. So, and that's quite fun too. Graded exercises. And now I want to mention something else, another way into this game through the New Zealand Programming Contest, courtesy of the New Zealand Computer Society. Thank you. Um, and this introduces a whole, another aspect, and that is the team idea. So now we have teams of three students on one computer, and they have to work together to solve a problem set. And here we have some of those students competing this year. These two photographs are taken from the, uh, the uh, New Zealand Programming Contest held here in Canterbury. This is a Burnside High team, open to high school students as well. And this is a team from Otago, team from Canterbury on the top. So this brings in a whole new idea, the idea of team spirit. And here we have a really big event. This is the International Collegiate Programming Contest. This was in China. There are 110 odd nations represented, uh, it's distilled from hundreds of thousands of um, players all around the world. And again, you can see the teams working together again here. There's a team showing the intensity of collaboration that you get. So you have both intense collaboration and you have the fun and excitement of the competition aspect as well. So I think it's a really exciting thing to get involved in. And the last slide is just going to show one more of the same thing, and that is our own team competing. There they are. There's our team from Canterbury. Um, University of Canterbury represented there. They didn't come quite in the top group, maybe, but to even get there is a big challenge. And University of Canterbury has, in fact, gone to the finals. Well, this will be the fourth, fourth year running as the top tertiary team. And, um, but we really do depend on training kids coming through from high schools as well. So I encourage you to get involved. If I put the two themes of the last two speakers together, can I uh, remind you about the programming challenge for girls, which yes, operates yes. in New Zealand using yes. Alice as a programming medium. Uh, operates in uh, Auckland, Monaco, uh, Hamilton, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin, as well as a couple of venues overseas, plus Gisborne. So that, proves, that doesn't have to be a main centre. If you've got a local politic, we can we can stay to PC14. Talk to me if you'd like to be a venue. And yeah, it's, uh, the Computer Society has been involved in some of these programming contests over the years for quite some time. Uh, we haven't always been able to send teams overseas because some of the venues have been uh, a little insecure. Uh, but uh, we hope to be able to continue to do that uh, in the years to come. Thanks Richard for that, and uh, yes, uh, your opening slide was certainly a, a trip down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, um, we have uh, Graham Doctoral. Graham's from a, a local uh, software company, mainly oriented towards uh, web-based uh, systems. Uh, they call Gary Lemon. Um, so the IT industry can come up with some innovative names. <laughs> and uh, Graham's uh, had, the company's had a bit of a, a run around the last uh, months, uh, shifting menus. Uh, what, three times, is it? Uh, twice. Twice, we anyway. We moved, yeah. Um, and uh, he's uh, got quite a, a team of locals and also pushing into international markets. So, over the ground. Thank you. Right, I thought I'd uh, just kick things off and uh, talk about uh, New Zealand, which is far better than Old Zealand. And my point there is that with um, software and the uh, computer industry, the rate that it's growing, New Zealand is the best place to do it. Um, remoteness does not matter. Uh, that, that we're at the bottom of the earth um, doesn't really affect our industries per se. Uh, we've got 40 million sheep, 4 million people, and 32 hairy lemons in my company. Uh, we've been going for 10 years. I'm a, a UIC graduate in computer science, so I do know a little bit about what it's all about. And uh, it's just reiterating again that probably 32 hairy lemons is probably better than a, you know, than a few sheep. Um, orcs need computer science too. Some of my friends are computer scientists uh, and they work for Weta. We do a lot of work in California uh, and we work a lot with the um, movie studios here building websites. And orcs do need computer science. To look like that, um, you need some fairly hefty software. Um, programming lets you travel the world, and the old rubber gloves I get travel along. Um, like I say, we do do a lot of work internationally. 
So it's an opportunity for young people to get out there to see the world and have a good look around. <laughs> 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 and, uh, yeah, and the rubber glove, we won't go there. Um, we do talk kind of funny. We do use zeros and ones. Um, I'm not so much a purist when it comes to talking computer geek. So um, I don't talk zeros and ones, but some of my people in the organisation do. So there's various levels that obviously you can um, enter a company and be involved, and some of the guys from Tate's are putting more zeros uh, and ones than me. Uh, that's because we are kind of funny. We talk funny because we are kind of funny. This is a team when it was a little bit smaller, about 18 months ago. Uh, that office is now a pile of rubble, but uh, moving right along from there. Um, we have a very good mix of people. You'll notice most of them are young, apart from the bald guy up there. Um, and we do have a good mix of, of uh, women and men. Uh, 8,000 earthquakes in a year. We need computer scientists more than ever. Hopefully they can predict the bastards, I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, until such time, um, to get things going again, um, as my counterparts have said, there's a huge shortage of uh, computer scientists and people that work in the industry. Um, now please don't carry guns, this is a slide I use for the US, and their computers work. Now that's for the locals here, because you may recall the INSES computer system many years ago. That is an example of a complete and utter cock-up. Um, Harry Lemon doesn't do cock-ups of that magnitude. <laughs> well, actually, we don't do cock-ups. Um, Ten slides to go, reasons to work with us. And I'm generalising here when I talk about reasons to work in the computer industry because, you know, there's so much going on and we need to get our young students uh, moving through the high school system and into the university system so we can employ them. I really need your help with that. Um, we build cutting-edge technology. We do work for the company's office. We do work for some of the biggest uh, companies in the country. Um, Ansco, which is the old uh, lamb and beef board. Uh, Black Hat Cruises, who you might know just locally, a very diverse cross-section of organisations, both domestically and international, and we need more staff. We build websites, bloody good ones, that's just a few of them that we've built over the years. We grow at around about 30% per annum compounding. So every year we're growing and growing and growing and we need more people to deliver those solutions. And at the moment we can't get enough. Um, so. We really need your help. Engineering and innovations are characteristics software engineers are renowned for. So you look at these little wee bikes here, they're a little electric yike bike, you might have heard them or seen them, we've got a couple of those. We didn't build them, have nothing to do with them, but they're a hell of a lot of fun. My point being, <laughs> Mike, we didn't even build the website, my point being is that we need engineers at different levels. Um, this is again for my American clients, 20 hours by plane or one easy Skype call, it's your choice. They get horrified about 20 hours on a plane, and when you tell them it actually takes two days to get home, they can't work that out at all. <laughs> <laughs> can't even comprehend that, you don't even go there. Uh, be a computer science superhero, uh, that's me dressed in a Captain America suit that actually hugged in an uncomfortable way, but putting that aside. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My point is that a lot of our staff get to travel around the world and uh, we've got projects underway in Burbank, California, Washington DC, um, uh, Oregon as well. Got them all over the place. Uh, Murray and I are both gingers with grey hair. Um, some of you who uh, watch that show, you know it's very big um, in the US and uh, they, they just love the show and that I'm a ginga, they get quite excited about that as well. Um, <laughs> New Zealand, you should come, I think that's fantastic. Yes. Uh, we love computer science, but not all of us can make it here tonight. We're too busy when Graham is away. <laughs> so they're all looking drunk. I can assure you they weren't, although they were at the Christmas party last weekend. But um, my point is, very diverse range of skill sets going on there. You've got um, project managers, account managers, technicians, hardware technicians, software engineers, graphic designers, um, all those kind of things. I promise you office more staff, which is why I'm here tonight. Um, and we've got to fulfil that promise. Um, at the moment, um, it's just impossible to find good people. And my counterparts, um, I'm hoping for the same challenge, either that or I'm not paying my guys enough and they're going over there. Um, but look, we really need to sort this issue out. Um, we create super code, as do my uh, counterparts, um, Java, ASP.NET, PHP, whatever it takes to get the job done. We're an agnostic company, which means we'll find the best software for the best solution. And I can take a wee breath, because I've caught up with it. <laughs>
The future Googles and Facebooks are here in New Zealand. What some people don't realise is some of the most innovative people and some of the most innovative ideas are right here. And what we need to do, we need to get those young guys and girls, we need to get them interested in computer science, and we need to get them through the schools, we need to get them through the universities, and then myself and my friends need to employ them. Um, that's all I've got to say. Come and say hello at dinner. I was enticed by the free meal, so I'm looking forward to my ribeye steak with mushroom sauce. Um, I can't have that, I'll have the pepper sauce. Um, <laughs> uh, my point is, um, we're a dynamic, fun company, and, and the country is full of young, dynamic com companies like ourselves. And we just need that push over the line to uh, get more people involved and get this industry going. Any questions? Fantastic. <laughs> well done, Graham. And who says... Can... What qualifications are you looking for? Um, most of our, actually all of our staff are tertiary qualified. They'll either be uh, through the university here and they'll be coming out of um, Tim Bell's uh, neck of the woods. Um, which is around computer science, and they'll have a computer science degree, they'll be programmers. They will be um, predominantly slightly introverted, um, do a lot of gaming at night, and have poor personal hygiene. <laughs> and they are the kind of people that we're looking for in that area of the business. Um, and then the designers, uh, which are uh, again probably coming from the Polytech, they'll be usability designers as well as graphical designers. Um, they will be uh, predominantly um, extroverted, uh, they'll predominantly be women, um, predominantly they seem to like their wine, um, but they also seem to be um, very much people um, oriented kind of. Um, My personal hygiene is <laughs> usually pretty good with the girls. Uh, yep, no, that's good. Um, the, the guys out the back in the programming world, I think they sort of um, hang from... Um, uh, hang from the roof at night as they sleep because they, uh, they are very much a different breed. And the biggest challenge in my organisation is getting the introverts and the extroverts to talk <laughs> and, and come towards a common goal. I'm going to take a short from Tim's neck of the woods. <laughs> well, you've got great personal hygiene, aren't you? <laughs> I do, I do take it back. Uh, thank you. Ignore those comments. Yeah. Right? That's the stereotype we're trying to get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, uh, computer scientists can be fun. Yeah. <laughs> and we can see from the variety of the, the companies we've had to uh, speak uh, that uh, the computer, computing industry and the, is wide and diverse in nature in, in all sorts of different ways. Anyway, uh, bringing us back to Earth, uh, next we have uh, Moffat Matthews from the academic uh, field again, and uh, I'm uh, informed that he doesn't have his slides on time, so we're going to have to keep him to time somehow, um, so uh, set your watches. Um, Moffat's from the Computer Science and Software Engineering Department again. Thank you. Um, no, I don't know how to tell time, that's true. I wear a watch because uh, um, people have... Uh, you know, and at academic level are meant to wear watches, otherwise they don't look academic enough. And when people come and ask you, um, what's the time? I, you know, you go, oh, I can't believe it's that time already. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I get around, not, not knowing about time. Anyway, who am I? Thank you for introducing me. My name is Moffat Matthews. I'm from the computer science department here. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. First and foremost, computer scientist means that I like uh, solving practical problems and I like solving computational problems. Quite often, practical problems come first and then the computational problems. I'm also a software engineer, and yes, thank you for actually pointing out that software engineers are cool again. <laughs> uh, and that means we deal with scalability. We deal with scalability of uh, number of users, we deal with scalability of size, uh, the amount of data is a totally different way of programming. I'm a researcher. Researcher means that I look at things and my favorite words are why and why not. And I like to push the boundaries, push the boundaries of research to see what we don't know yet. And finally, I'm actually a teacher as well. 
And uh, just like many of you know, being able to impart that amount of knowledge that you get to other students is very fulfilling and it actually teaches you quite a bit as well. Now, what I wanted to actually say was that we are in the middle of a technology revolution and it all stems from computer science. It stems from computer science, software, software engineering and a bit of technology to hold it up. Um, if you ask your students today what these things are, they probably wouldn't have a clue what on earth these things are. This, they'll look at you and say, this is a communication device. How do you Google chat on this? How do you Facebook on this? I mean, you know, how do you get anything? How, how do you search the web on this? Uh, you can't. And this whole shift of paradigm has actually brought us, why? Because of computer science students who have actually done this. This is my dad's desktop. <laughs> uh, many years later, he got a laptop <laughs> and uh, it printed in any color except as long as it was red or black. Yeah. It didn't have a delete button. I don't know if people were uh, that much more precise in those days, but it did. Uh, we are able to, with software now, gather groups of people, huge groups of people towards a common cause. Right? We just saw that this year. Um, groups of people all got all organized within just a few days. And they were doing amazing things just right here in Christchurch. This is the Egypt Revolution. I'm not saying anything about politics here. But even during the time when all communications were blocked and closed, within a few days you could gather multi-million people together in one spot and overthrow a government that has been there for 30 odd years. This is incredible. So, we are in the middle of a revolution. I'm going to make bold statements like this all the way through. I'm an academic, that's what we do. <laughs> we are in the middle of a software revolution, a technology revolution. And it is the students that are coming through from high schools that are causing this revolution. You and your students are the revolution, right? And things haven't changed so far, so quickly, even before then it has been now. One of the projects that I'm uh, responsible for is an audience response system. Unfortunately, it's got a very bad acronym for uh, um, abbreviation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lecture rooms are quite big. Well, some of them, you know, there have been people coming up with all kinds of things like environment on the end. Uh, audience system response, uh, engaging. Big lecture room, very little interaction between lecturers and the students. Right? Uh, the lecturer walks away not knowing whether or not they have actually uh, done anything, any good at all, if they've actually explained themselves. The students walk away with lots and lots of questions. So, what the, have they done? This is the current state of technology. They've made clickers. By the way, these are just numbers so you know how many slides I can count. I, I can't tell time, but I can count. <laughs> um, Clickers over there, and you might have seen these on the Oprah Winfrey show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show. And every so often, the lecturer will put up a question with some multi-choice questions. And these are either wired or wireless, and the student will press one of those numbers. And after a while, the lecturer can actually put up a graph showing whether they got it correct and what percentage they did. Now, we thought in cost 3 to 5, which is our advanced software engineering course, uh, and which Richard is actually a part of, and Brent Martin as well. But we thought, why not take this a step or two further? And we had some ideas, actually Richard came up with one of the ideas and said, let's, let's take this step, uh, uh, let's take this product and take it many steps further and give the students an ability to collaborate. That's one of the things that comes out of Cost 3 to 5. We never know what uh, is going to be at the start and what's going to be at the end. Um, it, it actually flows quite nicely through. And by the end of the year, what we got with close collaboration with our students was that they said, hang on, let's put these on wireless devices, any kind of wireless device. Instead of having clickers that are proprietary and they are wired or wireless with infrared, why not put them on any kind of wireless device they the connect to a server. The teacher can connect to that server as well, and I'm making this very simplistic at the moment. But just to give you an idea, 
which means that the teacher can actually ask any kind of question that these can support. They can ask image questions, they can ask long text answer questions, they can ask uh, any, any type of questions that you, you think these things can support. And this was a very good success story because we were able to collaborate very closely with our students. And what I'd like to say here is be bold, be courageous. You know, you're all going out there and Tim's probably freak you out about all these standards and all these things that you guys have to know and uh, how much stuff that you need to know. Be bold, be courageous. Go out there because these students, they are not our future leaders. We are not preparing things for them that they can then lead. They're actually our future changers. They're the ones who are taking that from us and then taking it for themselves and changing the future. Which means 10 years from now, I have no idea what the world's going to look like. It might have a totally different paradigm. Uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in is intelligent tutoring systems. And uh, intelligent systems, this is to do with tutoring. Before I was talking about lectures, 500 students sitting in a lecture hall, it would be nice in between times to have a private one-on-one -on -one tutor. Right? Why not have that? We've actually done that. It's a very difficult computational problem, by the way. It's got a big AI base engine. And the student is able to log in. The ITS knows about the student. It knows about the domain. It knows about the problem. And it can get very, very specific help about the student's solution right here. That's now being used in uh, over 15 countries, I think it is, with 13,000 students right now at tertiary level, and we've got a number of these uh, available. A change in paradigm. But what if we could know our users that much better, right? What if we could know our users just a little bit better? Could we provide them with adequate information, better teaching, better support? We've got this thing. Uh, it's a $95,000 uh, uh, piece of equipment, and it's an eye or gaze tracker. And what happens is the student just sits on there and does their work normally, and it tracks your eyes and your eye gaze and your fixations. You don't see that until the very end when it shows you as a plot or a diagram about the eye and gaze fixations. Um, so what I'd like to show you is two students, Sam and Frank. Both of them got correct, and, and the actual students is just that I've changed their names. Um, both students got this answer correct. And what they have to do is look in here, there's a problem text on the top, and the answer is somewhere here, and you can see the difference between how Sam did it and how Frank did it. And if we just had this much more information from the eye gaze data, would we be able to help them differently? So here's Sam. Those are fixations, by the way. Looks across. The problem comes down, looks in a hierarchical manner, and without any hesitation comes down the hierarchy, works his way down the hierarchy, and finds the answer. Right? And we'd say, well done. Well done, Sam. Now here's Frank. Oops. Frank looks at the questions, looks down the side, looks at the notes, looks at the instructions, looks at some of the nodes on the tree, looks at the instructions again, goes up somewhere looking for something, and I'm terribly sure what, and then looks at some more nodes, and then thinks, I'm going to do a linear search upwards, and I'll start from there, and I'll do another linear search and start from up there. It's not in there. Oh my gosh, yes, there it is. <laughs> now, we've said well done for both of them. Would this extra data, would this extra information have helped us? And that's the type of stuff that we do here at the Intelligent Computer Tutoring Group. Finally, I just want to talk about the uh, stroke rehabilitation intelligence system that we're talking about. Many people suffer strokes here, and uh, it is probably the number two killer in New Zealand, unfortunately, and there are different types of strokes. Basically, due to some reason, one part of your brain gets a lesion, and that lesion causes you to be impaired both motor skills-wise 
and also cognitive wise as well which means that your attention your memory the way that you talk all these things start getting affected too and the old model was well your brain is dead in that area right so we'll provide you with a carer a 24-hour carer who takes care of you who remembers things for you you can have a calendar, maybe, a diary, something like that, to, to, to make sure that you remember your doctor's appointments and to take your pills on time and things like that. But the new model says, hey, neuroplasticity. You can actually, the brain can actually reroute, reroute around the lesion and start training new pathways and new neurons just because it can. And there's another, uh, another new research which is to do with stem cell research as well. We're not doing that one, but we're looking at this at the moment. And so what we're building is an intelligent tutoring system that's going to help them do different tasks and intermingle them together until they build these separate neurons um, uh, pathways through their brain. It is not easy. It is a very big computational task, a very big algorithmic task, and this is just a dependency graph to make one cup of instant coffee if everything is in the right place, right? So if you can imagine cooking dinner, uh, opening the door for friends to come in, doing all those things, how huge this system is going to be. And for this particular one, we got funding approximately a million dollars to finish this one. And for the computer science, the R's uh, pro program, I say it nicely, I say yes. R's, <laughs> and I'll just say it the other day. Um, we've got funding now to put that into the University of Canterbury fully, and there are some students working on that right now. So finally, um, we're really <coughs> there now. Know your audience. Know who your audience is. For you, it is your students. For us, it is the people that we work for or work with and add goodness to the world. There are several different places, especially previously, where badness has been added to the world by computer scientists. And I can say this because I am a computer scientist. Add goodness to the world. In summary, we are in the middle of the revolution. Huge technological revolution. Computer science is driving it. You are the instigators of this revolution. right? And your kids are the ones who are actually going to be future changers, not future leaders. Be bold and courageous with them and get step into it. And finally, know your audience and add goodness to the world. Thank you. <laughs> Moffat, oh, question. Okay. So you can't miss out the question time. Okay. Um, the Interactive stuff where you're using, you know, portable devices and so on. Yes. Is, how far along the track is it sort of working? And I'm going to follow it up so you better know what the next question is. Could we come along sometime and have a look and see it working? Or bring our cell phones along and you okay. show it to teachers yes. from Canterbury? Yes South and Island? yes. Yes and yes. Uh, it is working. Uh, what we've done now is, because we used it as a cost three to five project, mm -hmm. and it worked, and at the end they did live demos. It'll be, it'll be really demos. exciting to see it in action. Uh, uh, between 50 and 60 people connecting yep. to this um, uh, server. And they were asking questions. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention. Any student can anonymously ask a question to the teacher as well. So it goes both ways. Right? And Tomorrow there will be people asking well, questions during this lecture. Uh, and so what we're doing now is to make it industrial strength and to put it into a University of Canterbury. Instead of 60 users, now we're going to hit them with 5,000 users or 10,000 users. It's, it's a slightly different board game, and uh, that's what we're working on. But yes and yes. Yeah, sounds good. But teenagers and cell phones and classes. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to move past that. Yeah, yeah, we really yeah. do. Because and Hysteria's going to die. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Annette, thanks, Moffat. And we've had uh, uh, another example of where technology works. The guys that use the technology in PowerPoint uh, were finished on time. Moffat was a bit over. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks all. It's uh, hopefully if you enjoyed uh, this interesting presentation format and our interesting array of speakers.
And again, uh, the Computer Society is, is there. We've got some uh, interesting uh, uh, programs which will bring uh, the industry to you uh, in the classroom uh, next year. And so watch out for more on that. And feel free to contact me. Um, I, I can certainly, even before that gets up and running fully, um, Ed and a number of other of our members have been doing it informally over the last year or so as well. Um, contact me, steve.davis at nzcs.org.nz and uh, we can put you in contact with uh, or more information on the programmes. And now we'll uh, head over to Tim because I'm sure we don't want to keep you from your meal. <laughs>